question for you. Why do we suffer? Every day, in many places in the world, there are people suffering from hunger, thirst, disease, neglect, abuse. But for what? Innocent people, even children, suffer from so many unavoidable tragedies. But why? Many claim to serve a loving God, but in the face of so much pain and suffering, it's hard to imagine a God who loves us. So, why do we suffer? All right. All right, let's get started. We are, uh, we are seconds away from beginning our uh, Big Questions seminar tonight, and uh, we're glad that you could be with us uh, in the audience. We've got a lot of people here this evening. Hello, good evening. Hello, good to see you guys tonight. Uh, we also have, hopefully, a lot of people that are watching online, so everybody turn around and wave to them. Hello. Glad that they could be here tonight. Uh, my name is Philip Jenkins, and uh, I will be sort of, I guess, facilitating some of the things that will be happening this evening. Uh, we're excited that you're here tonight in the live audience. We're excited that, that maybe you're watching on Facebook Live, and uh, we thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of things together over the next few days that we're very excited about. A lot of people have been working hard here in Calvert City, Kentucky uh, for this campaign uh, to do our very best to look at very tough questions that many people are asking and look, look at best that we can uh, to see what God's Word has to say about these different questions that people are asking. Now, before we get started this evening, I think we need to be sure to ask God's blessing uh, on the things we'll be doing all this week. So let's bow for a word of prayer and then we'll get started this evening. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful that tonight we're able to come together and uh, ask questions that we know that you hold the answers to. And we know that many times uh, we're still left wondering what the answers are. But I pray, Lord, that as we seek, we will find. I pray that we will trust you with the information that you've given to us in your word. Uh, we know that one day we'll have the chance to uh, maybe ask you a lot of these questions face to face in heaven. And we want to be able to do that. We want to be with you one day. I pray that you would bless um, Wayne Miller who will be speaking tonight. I pray that you would bless the speakers all week who have done their best to prepare uh, to to respond to a lot of tough questions that people are asking uh, here in our world, in our culture, in our community. Father, again, we ask for your blessing all this week. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, welcome. We are glad that you're tuning in tonight to our Big Questions campaign here in Calvert City, Kentucky. A lot of people uh, all over the place are asking tough questions and are looking for answers. And uh, I think it's important for us as we begin tonight to remember that there's only one person who knows all the answers, and that's God Himself. And so it makes a lot of sense for us to take our questions to Him. God is not afraid of our questions. And uh, so it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask tough questions. Uh, God's not afraid, and He wants us to search Him, and He wants us to seek and find. There will be a few different ways you can interact with us. We hope that this will be an, an interactive uh, session, an interactive seminar. Uh, we hope that if you're watching online, if you're watching via Facebook Live, we hope that you'll send us some questions. You can do that by commenting on the video itself if you'd like to post the question out there for everybody to see. If that's not your style, that's okay. You can send the question directly to uh, the Facebook page and we will have people who are administrators of the page who will make sure uh, to take those questions the best that we can. And uh, we do have a limited amount of time, but we want to do our very best uh, to answer as many questions as possible. So please uh, submit the questions either on the video itself or through a, a direct message where not everybody has to see it, whatever you want to do. Also, if you just want to call us on the phone if you've got questions, the number here that you can call and talk to someone taking your calls live is 270-395-4210. And again, that's 270-395-4210. Tonight, we'll be asking some difficult questions about the problem of suffering. I'm excited tonight to introduce our speaker. His name is Wayne Miller. Uh, Wayne and I work together at the Mount Juliet Church of Christ. Wayne is doing a, a great job uh, working here with us in the congregation. 
Uh, he's a good man. He has three children named Chris, Josh, and Mandy, and uh, his wife uh, is named Debbie, and they've been married for 40 years. They are a blessing uh, to us at Mount Juliet, and they've blessed a lot of people through the years, uh, people that know Wayne, love Wayne, and uh, it seems like everybody knows Wayne, and uh, they're blessed to, to know him. And, and Anyway, I'm excited to hear from him this evening. Watch this video, and then we'll get started. question for you. Why do we suffer? Every day in many places in the world there are people suffering from hunger, thirst, disease, neglect, abuse. But for what? Innocent people, even children, suffer from so many unavoidable tragedies. But why? Many claim to serve a loving God, but in the face of so much pain and suffering, it's hard to imagine a God who loves us. So, why do we suffer? Good evening. We are indeed grateful for those of you that are here in the audience, those of you that are watching by live stream, and no doubt from the video, the truth is, there is a lot of pain and there is a lot of hurt and a lot of folks are suffering on a daily basis. And while tonight we may not be able to supply every answer to the degree and the depth that we would like to do that, we do know that we have a source for our healing. We are grateful tonight that we have a source for our strength and a source from which we can approach knowing that He will bless us as we seek Him. You know, as I think about this difficult subject of why do people suffer, my mind immediately goes back to the book of Judges in chapter number 6 in the Old Testament. And there we read of God's people, the Israelites. And in reality, the Israelites there were being invaded by the enemies called the Midianites. And for seven long, difficult years, the people of God were victimized. In fact, it was to the point by these opponents that the attacks just grew worse and worse until the people were in just complete peril. And their crops, they were destroyed. Their livestock was being taken. The people were forced to seek refuge in the dens, in the mountains, of, in the caves. Things were really, really difficult. And during that time of difficulty, God in His infinite wisdom sent a messenger of the Lord and He appeared to an individual by the name of Gideon. And when he appeared to Gideon in the wine press, he said to him in Judges 6, in the verses number 12, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. O mighty man of strength, the Lord is with you. And if you read that account, and hopefully you'll be able to do that in Judges chapter 6, Gideon seemed immediately ready to, to blame the Lord for their condition and blame the Lord for the situation in which they found themselves. And he was very really quick to blame God for the plight and the peril in which they were living, in which they were facing. But we must say to this man's credit, he became convinced. And he became convinced of this. The Lord was with them. And he led, Gideon did, led the people of God to victory. But initially, before he did that, in Judges 6 and verse 13, when the messenger of the Lord said, You almighty man of valor, here was Gideon's response. If the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened unto us? That painful appeal. Those words that we find in, in Judges 6 and verse 13, no doubt, friends, have been echoed millions of times, countless times across our nation and from the lips of individuals that were languishing under pain and languishing under suffering. Sometimes we hear it this way today. If there is a loving God, why has, and you fill in the blank, why has this occurred? Why has He allowed this to happen? And it could be talking about disease. It could be talking about an illness. It could be talking about an accident. It may be in reference to death. But all of us at one time or another, we have either made that statement or we've heard a statement made like that by individuals. If God is for us, 
It's not a new statement, friends. Gideon made it in the Old Testament with the people of God. If God is for us, then why is all of this occurring? And no no doubt tonight, these questions, I mean, they grip the human heart. And individuals cry for an answer to help while they're fighting their way through the deepest of the valleys of life. And quickly tonight, I must say, God has not revealed everything that we want to know about the subject of life's problems. He has not revealed unto us everything that we'd like to know about human suffering. But there is no doubt He does allow us to have those. And I would even suggest there are times, at least in my understanding of the Word of God, that He wants us to have them. Because it's for our benefit and it is for our good and our blessing. Now we must understand and as we begin this subject that everything that happens, brethren, is not necessarily a message from God. Everything that occurs to us in in an area of life that happens needs to be interpreted. And I believe this is one of the keys for a child of God especially. That we interpret everything that happens through us through the filter, through the lens of God's love. 1 John 4 and verse 16 clearly describes that God is love. So everything that we interpret and occurs, we need to understand in that backdrop, in that background, that our God is a God of love, that our God is a God of mercy, that our God is a God of justice and holiness and righteousness and, yes, of judgment. So when the question is asked, if God before us. If the Lord is with us, that just opens the door to vast proportions. It is not a simple subject. There's not a simple answer. There's not one passage that we can go to and say, this is why, because God has not given that unto us. And while we may not know all the answers, I believe with all of my heart, brethren. Good friends, I believe with all of my heart there's some answers that should and can strengthen our faith. In God. Why do I suffer? Why is there so much pain? You probably realize tonight in actuality that suffering is the second oldest problem faced by the human family. It is antedated only by the problem of sin. Shortly after God, I want you to go back with me. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open to the book of Genesis chapter number 3. Because in Genesis chapter number 3... Shortly after God made man in His own image, Satan came on the scene and he tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden and she believed Satan and disobeyed God. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6. At that point, sin entered into the picture of God's creation. And at the same time, we need to understand that something else happened that deeply, deeply affects us even today. Suffering set in. And it has been going on from that time until now. And you see, any time man is separated from God, from his maker, that's going to mean trouble. Let's just, let's get that. Let's make sure we grab that. Do not let this this point get over our heads here. It, It is absolutely certain that sin separates individuals from their maker, and any time man is without God, there is going to be trouble. And that's what has occurred in Genesis chapter 3. But if you want to see what God says about it, let's look at Genesis 3, down in verse 17. He responded to Adam and said, Cursed be the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. All the days of your life, thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your brow or your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, and for dust you are, and to dust you return. And then in verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Ladies and gentlemen, from that point forward, man has been suffering and wondering. Why? I want us tonight to quickly take the word pain. P-A-I-N, pain. I want us to think a moment, a few moments in our study together, because pain is a result of our suffering many times. 
And just for a brief few moments, and then we'll be uh, taking a break to, to answer the, some of the questions that have been uh, submitted. So if you haven't done that, be, feel free to, to do that while we're studying. Uh, call the number that Philip has already given you or, or do Facebook, whatever avenue that you would like to use that you're comfortable with. We would welcome those questions. But as we think about the word pain, let me just share with you some benefits of this of, of suffering that I see. When I think about, and you may choose different words for these letters, okay? When I think about the letter P for pain, I'm thinking about what does suffering do? It gives me a better perspective. It gives me a better perspective about life. In fact, the, the Word of God even mentions that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man has been renewed day by day. For our light affliction is but for a moment. Now watch it. It's working for us a far more exceeding internal weight of glory. We do not focus. We do not give our attention. We do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen, those are the things that are eternal. In other words, the Apostle Paul says to the church in Corinth, it helps us with a perspective. Because in reality, there's two Greek words in the Word of God that, that talks about suffering. One of those words means decay, destruction. Describing a, a condition, if you will, which is... If it's not handled, if it's not taken care of, if it's not treated, if it's not arrested, then it would lead to death. In fact, it's a word that we get our word pathology. In other words, some of you, you've probably been to a doctor, someone in your family, someone with your friends, have been to a doctor and they say, okay, we need to send this off to the pathologist and we need to get his report. Why? Because it's really important that we see what this is because it could lead to destruction, it could lead to, to serious issues, maybe even lead to death. That's one of the words for suffering. But there's another word that is found in the Word of God for suffering, and it means struggling that requires effort. It means discipline, maybe even painful discipline. It requires an intense expenditure of energy so that we can have this victory. So what I'm saying to us, suffering does not have to bring decay and destruction. That it can be used as something that is beneficial, as a, as a stepping stone. Now, understand, we're not making light, and we're not saying that it's always easy to be able to use that and to make it a stepping stone of life. Sometimes it feels more like a stumbling block rather than a stepping stone. But what I understand when, when the Word of God says that we don't focus on this present dilemma. That is what He says. We don't look at the things right now that are temporary. What we're keeping our eyes on is that which is an eternal reward. Because all of our afflictions and all of our struggling and all of our pain is temporary. But He says we want to make sure that we give our mind and we focus our attention on those things which are eternal. The glory that we'll receive, the wonderful reward that will be that will be given. As I think about the letter A, I think about what can be accomplished. What can be accomplished? I would encourage you to look with me if you to Psalms one hundred and nineteen. I use the letter A for accomplish. Have you ever thought? Have you ever wondered? That in reality, there may be times in our life where sickness may be better than health and pain may be more beneficial than pleasure. We normally don't think that way. <laughs> I mean, we want to talk about pleasure and enjoyment. But do we ever stop and think, you know, there are occasions, there are times that in reality, sickness may be better than health and, and, and pain could be more beneficial than the pleasure. Psalms 119, the great, the great psalmist says in, in verse 67, he had that spirit and he understood that because it said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, notice the contrast. It's like saying today, one side of the coin, but now on the other side of that coin. Before this happened in my life, before the suffering and this affliction came in my life, I went astray. Oh, but not now. Now, 
He says in verse 67, it's different. I keep your word. There's some things that the psalmist said that were, that were accomplished. Look down just about four more verses to verse 71. He says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. Why in the world will the psalmist make this observation? Because he says in verse 71, that I may learn your word. I may learn your statutes. I may keep your commandments. You see, I believe there can be some things that come through suffering that, that helps us to accomplish in life. I'm convinced by my study of the Word of God and observation in life. You know, maybe individuals like Ellen Keller became one of the most inspirational figures of the century, not in spite of being blind and deaf, but because of them. There were some things accomplished. When we look at a, the letter A and we think about being accomplished, I believe that it gives us a platform to better serve God. It gives us a capacity. It makes us capable of serving God in a unique way. When I think about that, I, I'm reminded of an individual several years ago in a church where I was preaching. I was sitting in my office one day and this individual called and a very godly Christian lady. And uh, she knew that we'd had some, in that congregation, we'd had about, about four or five individuals, mothers, that had miscarriages. She called me in my office one day, and I was sitting there, and she said, Wayne, uh, do you have a moment? And I said, well, I, I sure hope so. And she said, hey, I'd like to, like to offer some um, help to you. I said, okay. She says, there's certain situations in this congregation that I can minister more effectively and I can be better at than you are. You know, for a minister, you kind of go, huh, who does she think she is? I mean, and she says, no, really. She says, I know that you've been out to sea, and she called an individual's name. I know you and your wife went out there, and she appreciated it. I know that, that you guys went out, you prayed with her, you, you cried with her, you empathized with her. But Wayne, there's something about me you don't know. And the reason I say that I can minister to that more effective than you can is because I've had five miscarriages. So therefore, Wayne, I believe I can minister more effectively than you. And I said, you are exactly right. There were some things that she could be, that could be accomplished with her and through her. And she said, I want you to do me this favor. I said, if I can. God forbid that we have another, but if we do have another miscarriage, would you kindly give that, that individual my name, my phone number, I would love to minister to them. Unfortunately, we had some other miscarriages. Every time I gave that mother this lady's name and phone number, and every one of them came back and said thank you, because she was a tremendous, tremendous help to me. Sometimes things can be accomplished that we don't fully understand. It keeps us a bright perspective. We're only here for a little while, folks. This is temporary. As much as we enjoy it, as much fun as we have, it's temporary. Pain helps us to understand of the perspective. We need to focus on that which is eternal. We need to understand there's some things that can be accomplished. The letter I, 2 Corinthians 3, and the verse is number 18. And that is image. The word image. I hope we understand tonight that the ultimate goal of, of, of God in a believer's life is to become like Him. That's what He wants of us. He wants us to become like Him. He wants us to be transformed into His, into His image. Now, under, unfortunately, there's some people in life that they just kind of have this mentality. They believe their goal in life, and they believe that this is what God's goal for them is life, and it's this, be happy. All I want you to do is, is, is be happy. I mean, as long as you're happy, then you're okay. No, listen. God's ultimate goal for, for His people is to be transformed into His image. In 2 Corinthians 3, in verse number 18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror of the glory of God, we are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. The Apostle Paul says to, to a group of Christians in the city of Corinth, here's what it's about. You are to be transformed, literally, 
We know what that word is from the caterpillar to the butterfly. That's the same, same idea, same thing. There's this complete change, complete transformation, an occurrence that is happening. Yes, God wants us to be happy. God wants us to enjoy life. God wants to show Him to the world. He wants us to have a peace that passes understanding. But ladies and gentlemen, God's ultimate goal for you and for me is to be transformed into the image of His only begotten Son. That's what He's really about. And sometimes what we can see through, through this process of transformation, 2 Peter 1 and verse 7 describes it like being through the fire. Gold being refined by fire. People who endure that suffering. There's a, something about helps us to become closer and more in the image of Christ. And then the letter N. We need to understand that man that is born a woman has trouble. It's only normal. It's only normal. It's going to happen. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. And the truth of the matter is, as someone once said, that life is a school. Problems are the curriculum. And eternal life is the diploma. Think about that. Life is a school. Sometimes the pain can help us to understand. And God has made a partnership. But I know so many times in this world in which you and I live, when there is a difficulty, when there is a suffering, when there is a situation that is unpleasant, when life deals you a hand that you do not like, that's difficult to play. A lot of folks immediately blame God. They immediately blame God. How in the world could a loving God allow that to happen to such a good, good individual? Well, we want to discuss that. I hope you have submitted some questions. Uh, we're going to take just a very brief break, maybe about a minute or so. And then we're going to entertain some of those questions with a thus saith the Lord. But again, thank you in the live audience for being here. And for those of you that are, are live streamed with us, we're delighted you're part of our study and part of our seminar tonight. We'll be back in just a few, few seconds. A question for you. Why do we suffer? Every day, in many places in the world, there are people suffering from hunger, thirst, disease, neglect, abuse. But for what? Innocent people, even children, suffer from so many unavoidable tragedies. But why? Many claim to serve a loving God, but in the face of so much pain and suffering, it's hard to imagine a God who loves us. So. Why do we suffer? All right, uh, good job. It looks like we're getting ready to play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or something. Uh, but we're going to, at this time, just take a few questions. We did have some that came in uh, while Wayne was up here uh, speaking tonight. We appreciate uh, everything that he had to say. So let's get to it. You guys ready? You think you're ready. We think we are. Yeah, that's what you think. Right. All right, uh, we well, do let's not start. know these questions. <laughs> do what? We do not know these questions. Yeah, no, do you we? don't. And that's what makes it fun. Right? <laughs> For you. For us, yeah. Okay, uh, let's just start. We'll start with an easy one. Why does God, who has all this power, God who can do anything, why doesn't God intervene uh, when something bad is happening, when someone's having to suffer, like if there's an earthquake that happens or a hurricane that's coming? or a child has cancer, why doesn't God just intervene and stop it? You want me to start? So, Go ahead. Softball. Okay. Yeah. Just continue on what you're yeah. doing. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm, I'm very hesitant to, in, in trying to speak for God when you say, why? Because reality is, God is infinite. All of us are finite. And the truth is, God's ways are better than my ways and His thoughts are higher than all of our thoughts combined. So while I'm reluctant to say, well, this is why, 
I mean, who am I to say, well, this is why God would do that? Hearing the question, I, there's a couple of things that would come to my mind. Uh, perhaps God, uh, we feel like that God doesn't intervene because you know, God has created man and He respects the very nature of our free agency. God created every one of us with the ability to be free moral agents. That we have the right, we're not, you know, our choices are not predetermined. And so therefore God respects that. And for us to be fully human, for us to make choices, sometimes individuals make choices that are not the best choices. And unfortunately, sometimes those choices, uh, Philip, would not only bring hurt and harm to themselves, but it would bring harm and, and, and hurt to others as well. But we're not wound up little creatures like little dolls that our children play with and, and just run out of time and, and God winds us up. No, we're not puppets. We're not robots. We are free moral agents created in the image of God. The only one, no animal, you and I, humans, only ones created in the image of God. So it would, from my study of the Word of God, it would seem that, that God must respect that, that nature of, of, of man being created in His image as a free moral agent, but also just respect the very nature of, of creation. I mean, the world in which you and I live. I mean, it has laws that govern us. And, uh, you know, if God is going to be God and we're going to be uh, individuals and humans, then He says, here's how the universe is operating. And here's how it's going to occur. Now somebody says, well, why didn't He create a universe that would just not have all these difficulties? I don't know. I, I had a fellow tell me years ago, Wayne, until you can know what God knows, because it was a situation in life that I was whining a little bit. And, and he said, until you can know what God knows, and Wayne, until you can do what God can do, then I would suggest to you, you don't really question what God is doing. And that stuck with me, because, you know, I was at that moment just whining a little bit, and and kind of lost my perspective. And so, you know, I think, I don't know what else may come to your mind. Well, I think uh, the goal, sometimes we don't see the goal that God does. Uh, how many parents do we have in our audience tonight? Do we have anybody have kids? Do you always intervene? Well, I know you do when you first have your kids. Everything with it, you're going around, you're going to catch them and before they fall. And, but it gets to the point that you say, okay, if they're going to learn from this, they're going to have to fall. Does that make you a bad parent? If they're going to, to learn a lesson from this, I'm going to have to let them go through this and let them suffer a little bit so they will know next time. And you say, well, well, that's a little bit, is it really different? Because God knows what He wants us to be. We want our children to be adults. And sometimes the only way they can become adults is through suffering. I heard a story one time about a man that was building a building and he was in, in the uh, business of um, shaping one of the, the stones that was going to go up into the structure itself. And the guy came along and he saw him and he said, what are you doing? You're, you're making that stone. I don't see anything around here that that's going to go into. He says, you see that hole up there? I'm shaping it down here so it'll fit in up there. And I believe that's what God is doing for us, that, that He sees some things, as Wayne says, that we don't see. He knows things we don't know. There's a goal that we may not be able to accomplish without that suffering. Mm, that's good. Can I just make one other comment? Seems like you're Maybe. going to anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Before we quickly conclude that God doesn't intervene, may I just suggest He already has? He sent His only begotten Son. God intervened tremendously. He sent His only begotten Son to teach us and help us to be healed, to help us to be a blessing to others. And God continues to intervene. Before we quickly make the assessment that God doesn't intervene, I believe the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous individual does good. James chapter 5. So maybe God intervenes in ways that we don't see, in ways we don't understand, and preparing us for that which is better to come. Can I add too? <laughs> he, yes. You let him. So. Go for it. Yes. Okay. Uh, when he sent his son, his son suffered. Hmm. He learned obedience through suffering. 
Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Sure. So even Jesus did not escape suffering. I did something that I shouldn't have done. I didn't introduce you to anybody. This, <laughs> oh, everybody this guy who just me. magically <laughs> appeared up here, this is Lance uh, Cordell. He is the pulpit minister here at the Calvert City Church of Christ. So that's who this guy is up here talking, if you don't know that. Yeah. Uh, but that's appreciate okay. that. I'd also add that it's been a while since Wayne has purchased any toys. They don't come with those cranks anymore. It's, it's like 50 years ago. Well, we man. still got them. A long time ago. Still got them. <laughs> Uh, a couple of more questions. Maybe we have time for one more of these, maybe two. Uh, someone online submitted a question that we've probably all asked before. Why do bad things happen to godly people? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, I go back to, to Job. Job did not get to hear the answer that we have. In the first two chapters of Job, you know more than Job ever knew. As far as we know, God never told Job why it happened. And yet in the midst of all his suffering, in Job chapter 13 and verse 15, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And so Job is, is a picture and a, a hero of faith because even though it looked like God was using him as target practice, and that's his words, not necessarily mine, his description, he chose to believe the best in God. And he chose to leave the why with God. And, and I think that's what we have to do, and it is so hard to do. And in that same verse, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him, or I will trust in him. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. And Job talks to God. And there is nothing wrong with you in the midst of suffering talking, talking to God because God can take it. It's when you begin to doubt God and you begin to blaspheme God that you fall into real bad problems. But talking to God and fussing with God, there's biblical precedent. And you see that throughout the book of Psalms. Yes, that's true. One Psalm of another, they're just, they reveal to God their, their deepest feelings and emotions, and those are not always pleasant, and they're not always positive, yes. and sometimes they even question God. But when you mention the book of Job, a passage came to mind was uh, uh, James chapter 5, verse 11. You have heard of the perseverance of Job, and you see the end intended by the Lord. What is it? That the Lord is very compassionate and very merciful. So while we think about Job, and really the book of Job, we, we generally say the book of Job is about suffering. I think if you go back and really study and look at the book of Job again, you'll find that the book of Job is about God. It's about God Himself. And He never tells Job, after 42 chapters, He never said to Job, this is why. This is the reason. It's about God, and it's about Job trusting and persevering. Mm -hmm. Because God is compassionate. And God is merciful, even when we may not feel that. It doesn't change who He is. If I was going to wrap it all up, and that's kind of what I'm getting ready to do, but if I was going to, uh, it sounds like we would ask all these questions, and at the end of the day we'd say, I don't know. Like, and so I guess, I guess to wrap it all up, and we come back to that, okay, why this, why this, why this, and we just say, I don't know, then have we wasted our time by asking the question, why do we suffer? Like, why, why is it a good discussion to have? Why is it good to, to talk through some of the things that we've talked through tonight? Absolutely not. I mean, the discussion is good, but the whole matter turns on faith. We're talking about God. God has asked us to trust Him. If we knew everything, we would be like God and we wouldn't need God. So the whole thing is about trust. I read uh, one of my favorite go-to verses is Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God our Father. And our, the secret things belong to God our Father, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever. Um, my favorite verse, Wayne's favorite verse, mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will uh, make your paths straight. So this whole thing is about faith in God. You want to up, one upstage yeah, me again, well, don't you? I just thought, you know, as you were saying that, that man, some of the benefits for, for me is it just helps me to come back to really understand, you know what, folks? We're finite. God is God. 
we're, we're weak humans. They don't have all the answers. But I know my God does. And the fact that just studying it and talking about it, praying about it, I believe it does a lot of benefit to us just for our own faith. I believe it helps us grow in our faith and realizing how awesome God really is. Because you know, this world in which you and I live, it is still upheld by Jesus the Christ. He created it, and He upholds it according to Colossians 1 in verse 16. I believe it just helps me to realize how much I need God and how loving and compassionate He is that He would allow me to be able to, to walk through some dark valleys so that when you get into the mountaintops, you can see clearly what has been behind and what is uh, in the present there. Just like looking over around. I can't see what's on the other side of the mountain. But when I put the effort to get to the top, and then you see all the beauty of the valley below, I believe there's a lot of benefit. Personally, I believe there's a lot of blessing. But be talking about it, thinking about it, praying, and discussing God is an infinite wisdom. That He knows what we need. And therefore, we need Him every hour. Sometimes we sing a song. We need thee every hour. So I think there, personally, I think there's just such benefit and blessings that come from studying subjects like this. Even though we may not have every answer, it reminds me to go back to the source. Let me jump in real quick and tie things up, and I'll let you send this out in just a minute, Lance. Mm -hmm. but, um, but those of you who are watching online, uh, if you're going through things right now and, and you're suffering, please let us know, and we'd love to pray for you. I, I appreciate you bringing up uh, the power of prayer, um, the things that we care about, and I guess one of the questions I asked was, you know, is this even worth our time? Uh, it's, it's pretty awesome that, that to God it's worth our time. You know, the things that we care about, the things that, that are our cares, He tells us to cast our cares on Him, for He cares for us. And so we want to pray uh, for one another. If we can pray for you, if you're going through a time of, of trial, a time of suffering, uh, we'd love to be here for you in any way we can and pray for you. Uh, Lance, send us out. Yeah. Um, I believe it was Martin Luther King who said, what does not kill us makes us stronger. And even though that's not Scripture, I think it's based on biblical uh, perspectives and principles. And I want to close with this verse tonight, and, and I hope you'll think about it. Paul says, I consider the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. You take any Bible character... And, and you call his name, Abraham, Joseph, Daniel, Jesus, Paul. One common denominator, every one of them suffered in some way. You are either someone who is going through suffering right now, you have been through suffering in the past, or you're about to suffer in the future. It comes to every person. The reason there's such a response to this question and answer session and our campaign is because we are dealing with a common problem. And we want to invite you back tomorrow night at this same time at 7 o'clock. We'll be discussing man's purpose, human's purpose in this life. We thank you so much for being a part of this. We want you to remember that it does continue tomorrow night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. If you can't be here live, uh, be at your computer for the live stream or with your phone. Thank you so much.